thanks, Dr. Bond. We're going to get Quincy over here and momentarily for our Q&A session okay. to wrap up our critical care symposium. First, I want to thank you, Michael, for doing all of the IT work and getting making all of this happen for those of us at Maryland and so many watching from around the world. Our, our thanks to you. And I want to thank all of the speakers this morning, Cami, Mark, John, Samar, Quincy, for really an outstanding job giving us some vital clinical pearls along with pitfalls to avoid in a variety of shock states. There are some questions that have come in. And while we're waiting for Quincy, I'm going to turn, I think, Cami, to you first. There was a question from Zach in terms of our residents early on. At what point are you considering giving antifungal therapy, the mycofungin that you talked about with those patients? Are you actually giving it in the emergency department? So that's an excellent question. Um, so I think it depends. Um, honestly, if, if I have a patient who comes in and they're in septic shock or they're very uh, severely ill and they're continuously running TPN, um, those patients are absolutely getting a dose of uh, antifungal in the emergency department right away. There are some patients who I wouldn't necessarily give it immediately. Um, early on, uh, like a, a, a new perforation, not quite so sick. You could probably cover with something like fluconazole if they were very ill. Obviously, early on, that you know that we worry a lot about the bacterial portion, and so in those instances, while I would have it on the back of my mind, I, I think if I was really seeing that these patients were very ill and not improving, um, especially, or if I found out after the fact that they were actually, you know they're immunosuppressed or they had something else going against them, then uh, uh, certainly I, I think a dose would be reasonable. All right. And in terms of just one other clarifying question, you had talked about end-stage renal disease patients maybe having indwelling catheters. Is there a distinction between invasive or indwelling catheters, triple lumen, HD catheters, pick lines per se for TPN? Are they all in the same or do you risk stratify those? in terms of indwelling catheters? Yeah, unfortunately, I can't actually give a lot of like evidence-based best practice here. I think, you know, I would certainly not do it in all in-stage renal patients who have a tunnel dialysis catheter, for example. Um, but if it's been there for a really long time, yeah, that would be a consideration. And again, what is a really long time? It's hard to say. Um, I do think that, you know, looking at the site is important, but again, sort of those baseline characteristics, if it's a pick line that's been placed for a while, uh, we know that those are still capable of getting infected, but, you know, combine that with, you know, severe diabetes or suppression or recent broad spectrum antibiotics, that's one of the, one of the lower, um, but still prevalent risk factors. So, um, those patients would probably get a dose as well, but not all pick patient patients with a pick line who come in. So it is, it's a little bit of, um, looking at, the whole picture and putting it together with, with what the patient looks like. All right. Thanks so much. Let me move over to Dr. Greenwood. John, a few questions on RV stuff. One, does the initiation of positive pressure ventilation actually affect your TAPSI measurement? And then two, as you're trying to get ultrasound assessment of the right ventricle, any tips on getting improved images in the obese patient? And any tips on helping to differentiate what may be acute or chronic RV failure? Yeah, those are all really good questions. Um, so positive pressure and RV function. So I have this, I have this great image of um, that was sent to me. Actually, I think it was from um, a friend who Dan Hossie, who uh, used to work. I, I, or it was it uh, shock trauma actually um, did this great little clip of um, what APRV does to the right ventricle. So for those of you, this is an extreme example, but it illustrates the point. <clears throat> As you increase your positive end expiratory pressure. So APRV it, for those, you know, maybe less familiar is a, is a ventilator mode that requires a high level of PEEP for a long duration of time where patients breathe basically CPAP. Um, at a really high level. And what he did was he, he took an echo of the patient, um, you know, at different levels of PEEP on APRV and showed that your TAPSI, your right ventricle dilates significantly with high levels of positive end expiratory pressure on APRV. 
Um, and so while that's an extreme example, and if we're talking about non-invasive or any sort of positive pressure ventilation, the idea is that if you are increasing PEEP or positive pressure without recruiting any additional lung volume, you can essentially be increasing your pulmonary vascular resistance, which will press back on the right ventricle and make it harder to squeeze against that afterload. So I, I, my, my point is, I don't think positive pressure ventilation or mechanical ventilation is like contraindicated in patients with RV dysfunction. I, I, I do not want the audience to take that away uh, from my talk. What I want them to remember is just be thoughtful about your ventilator prescription in patients with tenuous right ventricles. If they start having hypotension after you've initiated, because sometimes the work of breathing in and of itself can put strain on the right ventricle and the patients need to be intubated so that you can put in a central line, give them inotropes, like whatever it is that you need to do. Um, but just be thoughtful about making sure that the right ventricle is not getting worse as you initiate positive pressure ventilation. Um, so um, that's sort of my thoughts about that. And then the second question about how to improve your image views of patients who might be technically challenging. Um, there's a couple of things to think about. So um, a lot of times the patient's anatomy will dictate your ability to get good views. So, you know, thinking about the patient with COPD, right? Your heart's often shifted more vertically um, because you have these hyperinflated lungs that kind of move the heart in a, like in a different location. And so instead of getting really lateral, on the fourth, fifth intercostal space, you might need to slide more medially. Occasionally, if the patient can, you know, kind of work with you, um, particularly the obese patients, the idea is like, okay, I want to bring the heart a little bit closer to the chest wall. So you can, if the patient's able to kind of tilt them a little bit towards the left lateral decubitus, sometimes that will move the heart a little bit more towards the chest wall so that you can get a better view. Um, if they're intubated already, you can put like a little ramp underneath of the right side so that they're tilted towards the left. That will kind of do the same kind of thing. Um, it's hard to get people to hold end inspiration if they're spontaneously breathing, um, but you can sometimes ask them to take a deep breath in and hold it. Sometimes that will push the heart closer to the chest wall. Um, but sometimes it's just not possible. And I don't want people to get frustrated if they can't get a good image. My, I think the, the more you try, the better you get, and you'll kind of learn the nuances of it. So just by trying to get a good view, that's the first step. And, you know, surrogates, there is one last point. Sorry, I'm not, I don't mean to take all the time. Um, there is some literature out there that suggests that you can measure TAPSI with a sub xiphoid view. Um, it's called like a C-TECH. Um, I, I, I can put the, um, the paper link in the chat, but um, you can measure, you can basically get a guesstimate of your TAPSI um, through the sub xiphoid view, which may be a little bit easier to get in some patients um, that does correlate with your TAPSI. So a, a kind of a secondary option, if you will. Thanks, John. Let me transition to Samar. Question in the chat box. Uh, Samar, is there any role for CPAP in pulmonary unloading in patients with cardiogenic shock? Certainly, I think um, whatever device non-invasive you have is adequate. It's certainly gonna provide them support. Um, unlike true mechanical ventilation, um, both BiPAP and CPAP are gonna have certainly PEEP effects but are less hemodynamically um, affecting. So. If you don't have BiPAP, CPAP is just fine. Put them on, increase that work of breathing, decrease that preload and afterload, um, and reassess them. Great. All right, Quincy, you're up. A few questions came in via Ooh. text as well as in the chat window. A few um, questions. In terms of blood products, do you happen to know how fast we can deliver blood through an IO? Should we put it on a pressure bag? better to push pull with a syringe. Um, any insight there if we can't get adequate IV access? Well, I have not seen um, any literature or in real life, we have never tried to IO, put blood through IO products. 
So the rest of the panel may jump in about that, but um, a central line should take just as quick. And with the ultrasound, you know, if, if you could not get a central line there, the IJ with a, a, a peripheral IV going there quick, get some blood products, to buy some mm -hmm. time and get in there because I'm not quite sure how to do IOs and blood products. I'm sorry. All right. Well, two more questions related to your discussion. One is in the chat window. You know, your emergency medicine time is in <clears throat> more of our community site. You talked about hemorrhagic control. Do you see a role for Reboa in the community emergency department prior to transfer to one of our or a major trauma center? So um, in the previous version of Reboa, it's not because you have to cut down long catheter. This new version, it will be ultrasound. Got it will be sudden girl technique, and and. Um, by the end of this year until the uh, early next year, it will become standard of care for all bleeding in trauma patients. So then if you work at a trauma center, you will have access to the catheter. And early, um, you know, in the, in the, 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 the uh, previous version, when we inflate the balloons, we could not have a good idea of whether we occlude the entire zone three and then knock out the, the, the guts uh, circulation system. But with a new Reboa system, we have a way to manage it. And I showed up in, 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 in the, the, the monitor where you could inflate the balloon or you could leave it deflated, inflate a little, a little enough to bring the blood pressure up to reduce bleeding by enough time for the patient to go to a place where you know, there are more blood products. So you do you would see this as over the coming years expanding to outside major trauma centers for stabilization to get the patient to a trauma and center. That's the idea of the the, the new uh, Reboa kit. Make it easy for everybody to you know to get to do it. All right, one more question for you in terms of calcium supplementation. You're well, actually almost everybody on the, the panel gives massive transfusions from time to time, but probably in your CCR, you roll, you're giving a ton of massive transfusions. Are you empirically giving calcium supplementation or are you waiting for your ionized calcium value to return before supplementing with calcium? Um, usually by the time that the patient get a, a cooler, a massive transfusion, the patient is already on norepinephrine or maybe on visopressin. And we, as long as the patient have hypotension, we give calcium um, because it helps with, with, with blood pressure due to all of this uh, cardiac functions and uh, vascular um, contractilities as well. So. <clears throat> all right. And thanks, Cami, for dropping that in the Q&A in terms of IV fluids, not initially RBCs, but IV fluids at about 150 to 200 milliliters per minute with a pressure bag. So thank you for doing that. Dr. Sutherland, in terms of a little bit more generic question. So um, in terms of patients critically ill, shock patients, let's say you're not working in the ED tomorrow, you're up in the MICU and you are receiving a patient are there anything or what tips would you advise? So when you're receiving someone now with your ICU hat on, what is it that like you prefer to see in receiving these patients coming from the emergency department? Any pearls you can provide, any things you look out for particularly, or things that sometimes we, we could do better at when you're on the other end? Sure. Thanks, Mike, for the question. Um, I think it's all the things you're going to think of. It's about paying close attention to the patient, resuscitating them best you can before they get up to the ICU, keeping in mind, especially that there's in most ICUs and in our unit, a transition period where it takes time to transport the patient, takes time to get them settled, take, you know, often the nurses are doing their assessment, um, things like that. So it's important that you take a last glance at the patient before they roll upstairs, do what you can to stabilize them. And then the other thing I would add to that, which again is just good emergency medicine, I'm sure all of us do regularly, is closely communicating with your ICU team. Um, when you're 
And again, putting my EM hat on for a second, when you're in the ED and you have a critically ill patient, we all know you don't have a lot of time to do charting and you're not necessarily going to write a full, completely thorough note. So just making sure that you communicate to the ICU team any valuable, again, we talked about the two H's, right? That history is really key. Any valuable history you obtained can help point the ICU team in the right direction. Um, The converse side of that, I would say, is uh, sometimes the ICU team can kind of have early diagnostic closure. We know this with all inpatient medicine. So making sure that if there's doubt about the diagnosis you have, that's communicated as well. Uh, You don't want the the ICU team to just focus solely on our early impression in the ED necessarily not consider other possibilities. But honestly, the, the best answer to your question there, Mike, I think is just everything you do with every ED patient. And uh, we're always very happy with all the great work that's done downstairs when patients get upstairs. That's outstanding. Well, let me open that same question up to Cami, then John, then Quincy, and then we'll bring things to a close here. You may be on mute, Cami. I am. Can I get a refresher on the exact question wording? In terms of when you're not working in the ED, but now you're up in the ICU and you're receiving critically ill patients, any additional pearls from what Mark just said to think about that we can enhance our delivery of critical care and resuscitation in the ED for patients in shock? Um, I would say Mark's is probably a pretty, pretty great answer. Um, I think, yeah, the history is good. I don't expect anybody to have a full note. So um, I'll, I'll follow his lead on that. If you can just give us a verbal history, that's fantastic. Um, I do think if magically EMS dropped off a phone number to a family member, that's a great thing to have. Or if even, you know, you looking at the situation can tell that it's dire, some setup for the family um, is also helpful for us upstairs as we work through what's actually happening, you know, with more time and more resuscitative efforts to sort of set the stage for us to have those difficult but important uh, goals of discussion, uh, goals of care discussions later on. Thanks. John? Yeah. um, So I think the literature is pretty clear that, um, and I'm speaking to an audience that I think a little biased to, but the things we do downstairs downstairs matters, right? And so what we prescribe in the ED oftentimes carries forward upstairs in the ICU for some really critical moments of this patient's opportunity to recover. So that may be something as simple as appropriate ventilator settings, right? So not having a patient on 10 cc's per kilo, the magical 500 ml tidal volume, um, making sure that we're providing good quality critical care downstairs um, makes a difference for what's being prescribed upstairs. Um, And to me, that's, you know, that's the best part of my job is that I get to start the patient off on the right foot when I'm in the ED and then I get to carry it forward upstairs. But um, so simple, effective interventions early make a difference in the patient's trajectory. So um, low tidal volume ventilation, MAP optimizations, early initiation of vasopressors, um, rather than giving that extra fluid bolus for that tenuous patient um, who's already received a decent amount of volume resuscitation. Those types of clinical cues Um, particularly in patients who are admitted in the evenings or overnights um, in times when the ICU can be really busy and also stretch very thin for resources can really, um, you know, affect patient outcome. So, um, you know, that would be my suggestion. Outstanding. And Dr. Tran, final thoughts on that. Anything to add? Uh, unmute myself now. Now, maybe I would like to reiterate what uh, Dr. Windows lectures mentioned about and what John just said. Early initiation vasopressor. There have been so many times I receive patients with four or five liters of fluid trying to keep the blood pressure up. Early pressure does not, you know, hurt patient as much by that time anymore, right? And the other thing is that I, again, you know, I would love to see patients coming in to the ICU with two or three IV access so that, you know, we could get multiple things at the same time 
while trying to get a big catheter in there, we don't need a central line from the ED. We don't need an A line from the ED, but at least we need two or three catheters so that we could work with multiple things when we have available availability in the ICU. So. All right. Well, I think with that, we've had a robust Q&A. Let me just double check. Thanks, Dr. Lawner, for putting additional information in the chat on the humeral IO pressure bag for, for blood products. Greatly appreciated there. And once again, I want to thank everybody for tuning in, not only from Maryland, from the U.S. We've had a, a really robust number of folks from a variety of international settings. So our thanks for listening to our critical care symposium today. Huge thanks once again to Dr. Bond for everything he's done behind the scenes. Thanks to Dr. Brown, our chair, for continuing and endlessly supporting our educational efforts. Dr. Bond wanted me to communicate that in the days coming, I think these videos will be posted for those of you who would like to watch it again or watch it actually for the first time and registered for the symposium, along with an attendance certificate. Those of you that would like that will receive that. And finally, as we wrap up, I would like you, once you log off of here, to immediately open your calendars and highlight the first week of November, because that is when we are planning to hold the crashing patient. So Dr. Matu is working behind the scenes to solidify plans for the 12th annual crashing patient conference. It is one of our premier conferences here for, for UMEM. And many of you have attended that in the past. And we're looking forward to see what Dr. Matu prepares for us in terms of a lineup for the crashing patient. Details will be forthcoming, but it is going to be that first week of November. So please highlight that on your calendar and plan to attend in the fall. With that, I'm going to thank once again our speakers. Couldn't, this has been an amazing morning. Really appreciate all the time and effort that you put into these discussions, bringing us up to date on so many aspects of shock. Really, really outstanding job. So with that, we're going to sign off from the University of Maryland Department of Emergency Medicine. Thanks again for joining us. We'll look forward to seeing you in the fall at our Crashing Patient Conference. Bye for now. Thank you, everybody.